I know I have. Uh, thank God I don't make them anymore. I, found, I learned a very powerful lesson from Jesus. Here it is. You ready? If you don't make excuses, you don't have to take them. What is an excuse anyway? Well, an excuse is a not so, clever, not so cleverly disguised lie. What is an excuse? A bunch of words that you think other people will believe is a reason. <laughs> That's an excuse. Um, but the reality is an excuse is really nothing. It's nothing. It doesn't matter. Nobody cares. If you tell somebody you're going to do something and you don't do it, they don't care why you didn't do it. They only know that you didn't. Did I say that too fast? And I am telling you, your willingness to make excuses is robbing you of opportunities. In fact, it might even be destroying your life. Your willingness to accept excuses, I believe, is predicated on the fact that you're accepting somebody else's excuse as a down payment on an excuse you plan to make in the future. So let's just stop it. I'm going to read something to you from the book of Genesis, and we're going to talk about a bunch of Bible stories where people made excuses. And we're going to stop making excuses. See, here's the thing about an excuse. It doesn't do anything except deceive you and irritate everybody you gave it to. I know I said that too fast, didn't I? <laughs> like, it deceives you. you. Like, you think you did something. You thought, you thought you said something. And then the person you said it to, I knew I couldn't count on them. See, the scripture says, confidence in an unfaithful man in time of trouble is like a broken tooth and a foot out of joint. Well, what can you do with a broken tooth? You can't do anything with it. You can't chew with it, so you can't, it's useless. What can you do with a foot out of joint? You can't walk on it, so it's useless. And a person that's full of excuses, always making excuses, is pretty much useless, and all you're doing is letting folks know, I'm a useless person. Y'all didn't know I was going to come out swinging today, did you? I missed jujitsu practice last night, so here we go. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, not really, I'm, not, I'm not really in jujitsu. I'm just kidding. So Genesis chapter 3, we're going to find the first excuses in the Bible. Genesis chapter 3, starting with verse 8. It says, And they heard the voice of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord amongst the trees of the garden. How many of us do that? We hear the Spirit of God calling us, and instead of yielding to the Spirit of God and following and relating and immersing in time with God's Word and in prayer, getting our lives back in tune with the one who owns everything and made everything and loves us more than we love ourselves, we hide ourselves among the things he gave us as provision. Are you hiding from God in your provisions? Anyway, just thought I might bring that up because I thunk about it. Okay. It says, they, hid themselves, they heard the voice, they hid themselves amongst the trees of the garden, verse 9. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said, Adam, where art thou? God never asked a question that he did not already know the answer to. He knew where Adam was. He wasn't asking Adam where Adam was so he could know where Adam was. He was asking Adam where Adam was so Adam could know where Adam was. Adam, you are someplace you have never been before when I came looking for you. This is the first time Adam ever hid from the Lord. And see, the enemy is a master at making us think that when we sin, hiding from God is our best option. Actually, when we sin, hiding from God is our worst option. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's what the scripture says. Adam, where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid. And because I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee, thou shalt not eat? Is that a simple yes or no question, or am I missing something? Did you do what I told you not to do? 
And Adam said, And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest me, gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. Blame is one of the most popular excuses in the world. It's somebody else's fault. Eve did it. Well, I'm going to teach you something about Adam and Eve. I'm going to teach you something about this sentence right now. The woman you gave. Now, here's, here's what's interesting. He blamed Eve. He blamed God. You gave her to me. The woman you gave me. If you wouldn't have gave her to me, I wouldn't have ate the fruit. See, what had happened was you gave me this woman and she tempted me. I didn't put that in. It's what it says. And, and and, and, and so, so she blamed God. I mean, he blamed God. He blamed Eve. He took zero responsibility. He didn't say, yes, I ate it. Yes, I totally disregarded what you said and ate the fruit. Because she was leaving the garden, I wanted to go with her. Right? <laughs> he didn't say that. <laughs> right? He just said, the woman who you gave me, she gave me the fruit and I ate off of it. The blame game. She played the, he played the blame game. I'm going to tell you something. Maybe you're one of those people right now who you're blaming your parents who didn't hug you enough, didn't love you enough, didn't whatever enough. You're blaming them for the way your life is. I don't diminish nor dismiss the fact that that happened. But that's not the reason. Well, Myron, you don't understand my situation. I was, the reason I'm, the reason I'm in the situation I'm in is because you know, I'm a black man in America. Well, America's not been the greatest place on earth for black people for a long time. But that ain't the reason. I'm just keeping it real. Well, you know, I just didn't go to a good enough school. That may be true, but that ain't the reason. See, here's what you got to understand. There are two types of factors in the world. How many? We can all count to two. Here's what I like about two. We can count that high, and it's an easy number to remember. Two. There are two types of factors. There are contributing factors. The fact that God gave Adam Eve contributed to the situation. The fact that Eve offered Adam the fruit contributed to the situation because they were contributing factors. Hear me now. But the other type of factor is a determining factor. And determining factors actually determine the actions we take. And the actions we take determine the outputs we get because inputs create outputs. And so, yes, God was a contributing factor. Yes, Eve was a contributing factor. But Adam was the determining factor. Here's how we can tell the difference between contributing factors and determining factors. Well, I'm a woman in a man's world. I don't deny that. And I don't deny that it's harder for women in a lot of ways in the world than it is for men. I don't deny that. But I'm going to tell you something. That ain't the reason. Your life ain't working. Don't hate me. Just pray for me. Determining factors are all outside of us. Contributing factors are all in, I mean, determining factors are all inside of us. Contributing factors are all outside of us. That person's a racist. That's a contributing factor. It's not a determining factor. I'm a woman in a man's world. That's a contributing factor, not a determining factor. Hey, I... One of the reasons I talk about one of the reasons I talk about so-called racism, which is such a goofy term, racism is a goofy term. Like he's a racist, she's a racist, they're a racist, he's a racist. It's, it, it is what it is. You have to you have to have a word for it. So I guess that's one of the words that you could use. You could you could use prejudice. You could use bigoted. But then now they've conflated the meaning of those words. When you disagree with somebody, now you're a bigot, right? So. So we live in such a confusing world, unless you know the truth, and the world's not confusing, then you just recognize that they're confused, right? Anyway, nobody, you, you'll, 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 you'll have to travel a long way to find somebody 
who has been as negatively impacted by the disadvantage that black people have in America more than me. Like I've been negatively affected and impacted every day of my life by segregation. You say segregation is over, okay, fine. But before it was over, I was born in a segregated hospital. Six years after the polio vaccine was discovered. But that hospital didn't have the polio vaccine. My whole left leg shriveled up to almost nothing. Because I didn't get the care. Because my skin color was the wrong color for America in those days. Guess what that is? A contributing factor, not a determining factor. What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had teachers that didn't like me. But, you know, the feeling was mutual. But <laughs> that was a contributing factor, not a determining factor. Like, when I was growing up, people didn't like me because of the way I talked. People didn't like me because of the way I looked. Some people don't like me now. Contributing. So stop thinking something outside of you is the reason your life the way it, is the way it is. Stop playing the blame game. Stop blaming God. Stop blaming your wife. Stop blaming your husband. Stop blaming your children. Stop blaming your parents. Stop blaming the system because there are other people who had the same contributing factors working against them that you have working against you, and they had their determining factors inside of them their character, their integrity, their, their diligence, their determination would not allow them to capitulate to the contributing factors in their life. I'm not going to pretend that contributing factors aren't painful. I'm not going to pretend, well, I didn't, grow up with a, I didn't grow up in a family with a mom and a dad, so I don't know how to be a dad. I never had a dad, so I don't know how to be a dad. That's a contributing factor. It's not a determining factor. You can decide to be one because you didn't have one. I'm going to be the kind of dad I never had. Hmm? I learned how not to drink alcohol by watching people in my family drink alcohol. Mm-hmm. I wish I had some help. I, I, I quit drinking when I was 11. No, I'm serious. I could have allowed, I could have blamed alcohol I could, have, I could have blamed the fact that I had polio, I got a brace on my leg, I can't get a job, you know, so I can just, I, I can just depend on society and what I'm going to do is I'm going to just get drunk every day and drown my mis- myself in misery. And I could have bought into the lie that that made sense and that's a good reason. But it's not. Your excuse is not a reason. Rise above excuses. I think of Viktor Frankl. Viktor Frankl was in a concentration camp for I don't know how many years and lived through it and came back and impacted millions of people's lives because the determining factor inside of him was greater than all of the contributing factors outside of him. How many of y'all are picking up what I'm putting down? Nelson Mandela. If I were going to use a verse, I don't even know if Nelson Mandela was a believer, but I know he was an amazing human being. And he was in prison for decades for being a black man. He decided, he, he determined while he was in prison, which are not great contributing factors. I am going to change my country. And he became the president of the country after he got out of prison. And you think you've got an excuse? Frederick Douglass was born into slavery was not allowed to learn how to read. His master caught his wife teaching Frederick Douglass some other slave children how to read, chewed her out and said, woman, don't you ever let me catch you doing this again. And Frederick Douglass came to the conclusion as a six-year-old, approximately, because he didn't know his birth date, the person who owns me and who sold my mother away from me and who could sell me away from my family who can take my life and not be prosecuted, if he's that dead set against me learning how to read, it's the most important thing I must learn how to do. That's called a determining factor. And so Frederick Douglass, every time he found a piece of paper with some words on it, he hid it 
and he'd go practice the things his master's wife taught him. And he worked in the big house, and he would take he would take scraps from the big house and trade it to poor white children in exchange for them teaching him how to read letters. He became such an eloquent orator that when I read his autobiography, A Narrative in the Life of Frederick Douglass, there were so many words I had to look up in the dictionary as a college student from a man who taught himself how to read. He became such a great orator that he gained a, an audience with the President of the United States and the Queen of England and was instrumental in the abolition of slavery. Maybe the difficulty that you've gone through in your life is the catalyst that God ordained to use in you to change the world and make it better for future generations. But he's not gonna do that. You think it's your reason, but it's actually your excuse. What excuse matters? None of them. Not a single solitary one. Oh, but that wasn't even the only, that was, that, that, that was Adam's excuse. Let me keep reading, because there's, there's some excuses all up in this excuse pile. Uh, and, the man said, um, and the man said, the woman who, verse 12, the woman who thou gavest to be with me, she gave me the tree and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, what is this that thou had done, hast done? She said, well, the woman said, the serpent beguiled me and I did eat. She ain't wrong. He beguiled her, but that ain't the reason. You know why Eve ate the fruit? Because she wanted to. You know why Adam ate it? Because he wanted to. See, the scripture tells us clearly in James chapter 1, God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man, but every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust. That means if it ain't inside you, when it tempts you outside, it ain't going to find no place in you. Somebody can offer me a cigarette all day long. There's no universe in which I am tempted to smoke a cigarette because I hate it. I hate the smell of it. Somebody can offer me, oh, would you like, would you like to go out and get drunk with us? No. It's not even, it's, it's, it's an outside temptation. It's an external temptation. But here's where the trouble comes. When the external temptation matches the internal temptation up in here, that's when we got trouble. Now, somebody pushes me on the wrong day in the wrong way. I don't know. That, um, there might still be a little bit of that up in here, up in here. Might, a little of that might still be up in here. I hope it ain't, but it might be up in here. <laughs> she said, the serpent begot me. He, so I was, I was talking um, to Sharon about this <laughs> over a few minutes ago. Like Adam and Eve, everything they had ever heard until Eve spoke to the serpent Everything they'd ever heard, every word they'd ever heard, every word they'd ever spoken was truth. They had never heard a lie before. They were innocent. They didn't know, they didn't, they didn't know, they didn't have the experience of having been lied to before. So the serpent did beguile her. He did trick her. But that ain't why she ate it. She ate it because she wanted to. How many of y'all tracking? Just like when you sin the sins you sin, because it's up in there, same thing. Now it wasn't in her. It was outside of her, but she allowed, she was influenced by the world, the flesh, and the devil. Here's what it says. It's, it's really interesting how this is like patterns that keep showing up in scripture, right? It says, and when the woman saw the, the tree, saw, lust of the eyes, tree was good for food, lust of the flesh, tree desires to make one wise. Oh. Desires to make one wise. Wise as a serpent, harmless as a dove. There's the devil influence. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Here's what's really, here, here, here's where Eve messed up. She messed up giving attention to the enemy. See, Satan wasn't trying to get her to eat the fruit at first. He was just trying to get her to pay attention to it. Do you understand the tree of knowledge of good and evil was in the center of the garden? Also, the tree of life was in the center of the garden. But around all those trees, they had all kinds of other trees. They had apple trees and pear trees and plum trees and peach trees and, and pineapple trees and olive trees and, 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 and fig trees and trees and trees and mo trees. And God said, you can eat off all these trees, but this one, don't you eat off this tree. This is mine. Don't eat off of it. Okay. 
They had an abundance of trees that they could eat off freely. Every tree freely eat. That's abundance. It does not get any more abundant than every freely. But of the tree that's in the midst of the garden, thou shalt not eat of it. For the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So Adam and Eve had everything. They only lacked one thing. Did you ever think about the fact that the very first temptation in the history of the world was the temptation to focus on lack? He got Eve's attention on the thing she didn't have. And he said, now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. He said unto the woman, yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. That's not what God said. In fact, I'm going to write it on the board. Write it on the board. So, yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. I never said that. Here's what God said. God said, when God said, here's what he said. He said, it says in Genesis chapter 2, um, verse 16 and 17, and the Lord God commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. Of every tree freely eat. Does it get any more abundant than every freely? What if everything you desired in life was free? Is there any more abundance than that? Nope, every freely is pretty abundant. But of the tree, the tree. How many is that? Talk to me, everybody. How many is that? That's one. So Adam and Eve are in this garden, the Garden of Eden. Garden means enclosure. So it was, there was a wall around it. It was a place of protection. Eden means pleasure. So the Garden of Eden was God's protected place of pleasure and provision for his people. Okay. So in the Garden of Eden... There's a tree in the middle called the tree of knowledge of good and evil. There's another tree in the middle. It's called the tree of life. Then you got a whole bunch of other trees that are called, we're just going to call them for the sake of the illustration, we're going to call them every freely trees, every freely tree. What kind of tree is that? That's an every freely, okay? <laughs> and we got all these every freely trees. And they could eat off of all of these trees that they wanted to. <coughs> Excuse me. All these trees. Freely, of every tree of the garden, freely eat. Of every tree, freely eat. Everybody say every freely. Every freely. Every, you could eat off all these trees for free. They didn't have a grocery bill at all. Okay? Now watch this. Adam and Eve, down here in the corner. Here's what they had to do. In order for Adam and Eve to get to the thing they lacked, they had to walk past and ignore all of the abundance that they had to get to the thing they lacked. What caused them to do that? They were focused on it. The servant said unto the woman, um, Yea, if God said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. The woman said, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the tree that's in the midst of the garden, God has said, don't eat of it, neither shall you touch it, unless you die. God never said, don't touch it. See, Eve made the same mistake. You make the same mistake I make. She thought she could use willpower to do the right thing. Willpower doesn't work. Hmm. Your flesh is not going to help you conquer your flesh. How many of y'all track it? And so, so she said, neither shall you touch it. She said, if I don't touch it, I'm not going to eat it. Satan knew he didn't have to get her to touch it. He just had to get her to pay attention to it. Why? Where attention goes, intention follows. So if you pay attention to something long enough, you will set your intention on that thing. Y'all tracking? And so, so the, woman, um, the woman said, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the tree that's in the midst of the garden, I'm going back to my seat now, y'all, so for somebody with the camera. The tree that's in the midst of the garden, God has said, um, you shall not eat of it, for the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. The serpent said, ye shall not surely die. He's directly contradicting God's word. And then he says, for God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, your eyes will be open and you will be as God's knowing good and evil. Here's what Satan said. Here's how he tricked her. He said, if you will focus on lack instead of focusing on abundance, you will be more like God. Wow. That's a really modern belief in modern day churchianity, isn't it? This is, this is a, like, maybe that's why the scripture says we are not ignorant of his devices. That word device is not tools, it's not schemes, it's not plan. It's the Greek word noema, from wh which means thoughts. We're not, we're not ignorant of his thoughts. What does that mean? That means 
Satan deceives people by putting thoughts in their mind and making them think those thoughts are their thoughts. So yes, the serpent did beguile her. How do I know Satan puts thoughts in people and makes them think? Because the scripture says that Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. David thought that was his idea. Huh. The scripture says in the book of John, I think it's John chapter 13, um, it says, it says, the devil now having put it in the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Judas thought that was his idea. Ananias and Sapphira sold the land, gave part of the money, said they gave all of it. Peter said to Ananias and Sapphira, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? Ananias and Sapphira thought that was their idea. One of the things we better get good at is recognizing when a thought comes from Satan because all thoughts don't originate from God and they don't all originate from you. The serpent beguiled me and I did eat. He did beguile you, but that was a contributing factor. That was not the determining factor. The determining factor was you wanted to eat it. Real talk. How about Saul? Tall, dark, and handsome? He was. The scripture says he was head and shoulders above all of Israel. That means the second tallest person in Israel came up to Saul's shoulders. <laughs> what? That's a tall joker. Okay, cool. God made him king over Israel. God told him, here's what I want you to do. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, go wipe out the Amalekites. Here's what he said. And this, some of y'all ain't going to like this because y'all think God is only love. <laughs> One of the reasons his love is so strong is because his hate is so strong. Anyway, I'm just saying. Because <laughs> without hate, love has no meaning. Okay, I'm just, I know. Don't sound good. God don't. Anyway. Um, so, <laughs> so, God said, wipe out the Amalekites. Now, this, this doesn't make sense to us in our Western society, but here's what he said. I want you to kill every man, every woman, every child, every suckling, every animal. What? Wipe them out. Here's what it says Saul did. Saul killed, slew the Amalekites, but he kept Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive and kept all the best cattle. All the things that were like diseased and sick, he killed all those, but he kept all the good stuff for himself. Saul, I mean, Samuel came to Saul and said, what have you done? He said, blessed be the Lord, I've kept the commandment of the Lord. Why do I hear these ox, the, what's this moo, moo, ba ba? I keep hearing? He said, oh, the people wanted to keep the best stuff. He said, since you've rejected the word of the Lord, here, here's, here's what that means. Your excuse don't matter. Because you've rejected the word of the Lord, God has rejected you from being king over Israel. I'm telling you, your excuses are ruining your life. And see, Here's what happens. Here's the, here's the problem with your excuse. Here's a big problem. When you make an excuse and somebody accepts, you, accepts it, or they tell you they accept it because they didn't really accept it. They tell you they, ex they accept it. They're making you believe life works a way that it cannot work. They're letting, you get, they're letting you think you can get away with not being a person of your word. Is that too tough? Yeah, but that's what they're doing. They're like, they're, yeah, oh, that's okay. That's okay. We all have, okay, cool. But watch this now. Watch this now. You're going to do it again and again and again and again, and eventually you did it too much. Yeah, but you don't understand how hard I'm trying. How hard I'm trying is nothing more than like propping up a future excuse you plan to make. There's no such thing as trying. There's do and don't do. What does that even mean? You know what it means? Nothing. Hmm. Okay. I'm, I'm going to fast forward. Just so, I want to show you three more types of excuses that we see in Scripture. Um, John chapter 5, I'm just going to tell you the story. There's a man who's lame for 38 years. He can't walk. He's laying um, at the, um, by the pool of Bethesda. Jesus comes to the man and asks him what seems to be a ridiculous question. But since Jesus don't ask ridiculous questions, it's not as ridiculous as it sounds when we look into it. When we look at how the man answered, we know that it wasn't a ridiculous question. Jesus wasn't asking the man the question 
because he wanted to know the man's answer. He asked the man the question because he wanted to show us that excuses don't matter. Here's what he said. Now, you're lame 38 years. You can't walk for 38 years. You lay in on your side for 38 years. If you want to move, somebody has to come move you for 38 years. Would you like to be made whole? I don't know. That seems like a fairly straightforward question, but kind of ridiculous. He's been there 38 years. Well, of course. He didn't say, well, of course. He didn't say, well, I declare I've been waiting for you my whole life. You know what he did? He started making excuses. Here's what, I'm going to give you the three excuses he made. He said, it's somebody else's fault. I'm doing the best I can, and other people are just better than me. I don't remember him saying that. Okay, here's what he said. He said, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. What's that? Because what happened was an angel came down and stirred the water, and whoever, got, whoever was sick got in the water first. After it got stirred, they got healed. So Jesus said, would you like to be healed? He said, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. That ain't what I ask you. You think, but the poor guy, has been laying there for 38 years, and every time the pool got stirred, his family had gone on lunch break or something, coffee break. They wasn't there. It's mama's fault. It's daddy's fault. It's brother's fault. It's sister's fault. My friend's fault. I don't have anybody who will help me do it. So therefore, that's why I, I'm still here. I didn't want to ask you, would you like to be whole? Well, while I'm coming, when the water gets troubled, I start moving toward the water best I can, and I'm crawling, I'm dragging myself, I'm doing the best I can. That is not what I ask you. I like what Jim Rohn used to say. How many sales calls did you do today? And they'd say, well, what happened was, he said, no, 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 I don't need a story. I need a number. The reason we make the space so small is so a story won't fit. We need a number. We need a number. Hmm? Jesus said, I said, would you like to be whole? You, no, you don't understand. I don't have no help. I'm doing the best I can. But other people are just better than me. While I'm coming, another steppeth in before me. I ain't good as the mother folk. See, God blessed them in ways he didn't bless me. That's why I'm still here. That is not what I ask you. I ask you if you'd like to be healed. I don't care about your excuse. Your boss doesn't care why you didn't get the work done. Your wife doesn't care why you didn't pay the mortgage. Your kids don't care why supper wasn't done. Your husband don't. Like, nobody cares. Nobody cares. The person you loan money to doesn't care why you didn't pay them back. They just know that you didn't pay them back. The, and by the way, if you think your excuse is really that valid, write one and mail it into your mortgage company and see what happens. Write one, mail it into the light company, electric company, you're going to be living in the dark. Excuses are worthless. Nobody cares. I'm not saying they don't care about you. Maybe they care about you. But even people who care about you don't care about your excuse. Since they're worthless and a waste of time, and tell people that I'm a liar who's pretending to tell the truth, let's stop making them. And let's stop taking them. Because when this man gave Jesus all of these excuses, he didn't accept one of them. Jesus didn't say, oh, you poor thing. Let me go have a talk with your family. They should have been here when the water got troubled. Well, I guess I should have given you more ability. You're, you're right. You're not as good as other people. No, he didn't say that. Here's what he said. Rise. Get up. Take up your bed and walk. It is time for you to start carrying what's been carrying you. I wish I had some help in here. Like, we've been laying on our bed of excuses thinking people care. They don't care. Hey, I get it. Stuff comes up. I get it. Stuff comes up for all of us. But from now on, if you want to turn an excuse into a reason, if you want to turn it into a reason, 
At least tell the person you're giving it to how you plan to fix it and when. I don't know. That seems to make sense, doesn't it? Not, yeah, well, um, I, I told you I was going to be there and I couldn't make it, but um, I should have called you and told, yeah, you should have. Because faithfulness and, I mean, confidence in an unfaithful man in time of trouble is like a broken tooth and foot at joint. Jesus said, rise, take up your bed, and walk. It is time that we, as followers of Christ, stop making excuses for not practically applying the word of God to our lives. We take up the sick bed of excuses we've been making, and we walk in the ways of life. Your excuses are destroying your life. Somebody who was going to do a business deal with you won't do it now because you didn't keep your word. But you don't know what I've been going through. Yeah, but you don't know how much I don't care. I care about you, and I care about what you've been going through. I don't care that that's why you didn't do what you, didn't, what you said you were going to do. I don't care. Whatever your reason is, nobody cares. People will pretend to care. Uh, you know what I'm doing? I'm giving you the faithful wounds of a friend. I'm telling you what other people are thinking. Because they ain't going to tell you because they want you to feel good, even if it harms you. I want to tell you the truth even if it hurts you. Nobody cares. It's not that they don't care about you. I love people. I love everybody in my family. I love all my friends. I, love, I just love people. I love people to give me a reason not to. Yeah. And guess what? As much as I love them, the excuse doesn't matter. <laughs> All I'm saying is this. Don't put another person in a situation where they either have to lie to you and tell you they accept your excuse or hurt you and tell you that they don't. Let's just stop making them. Wow, won't our life be better? Won't, here's what the scripture says. Here's what the scripture says. Who, who, shall, who shall stand in thy holy hill? Who shall dwell in thy tabernacle? Who shall stand in thy holy hill? He that walketh uprightly and speak and work. Um, I should read it. It's uh, Psalms 15. But here's one of the things it says. He that sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not. What does that mean? That means somebody who will keep their word even if it hurts them. Recently had a client who bought a $350,000 VIP day. I know that sounds crazy, but it is what it is. And if somebody buys a $350,000 VIP day, if they pay for it up front, it's $350,000. If they pay for it over time, they pay $150,000 down and $20,000 a month for 12 months, which makes it $390,000. So, you pay 40000 less if you pay it up front. Okay, cool. She thought it was 40000 off of the three fifty if she paid it up front. And so we had a conversation because she was like, yeah, I'm going to wire the rest of the money. I owe you $95,000 more. I said, well, it's not ninety five; it's one hundred thirty five. Well, I thought it was 40000 off, but that ain't how it works. This is how it works. But I said, since there was a miscommunication and you misunderstood it, I don't want you to suffer harm from that, so I will happily give you back your $150,000 deposit, and I'm not going to be upset about it at all. I don't, I don't really need the money, and so I'll give you your $150,000 back, but I can't let you pay a different price than everybody else pays, because if I did that, I'm not a person of my word. You're tracking? See, people want you to break your word because they didn't understand. They want you to break your word because they didn't keep theirs. Let's don't, put, let's don't put people that we love in that situation. You know why? Excuses don't matter. And they're destroying your life. So stop thinking they matter. Stop using them. And let's just rise up and be people of character and do what we say we're going to do. Here's what it says about Jesus in John 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, and the same was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. 
Oh, and in him was the life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shined in darkness, darkness comprehended it not. You know what it says in verse 14? And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as the glory of the only begotten of the Father. Huh, isn't that fascinating? The word became flesh and dwelt among us. Now, I understand that's talking about the word, Jesus became flesh and dwelt among people. I get that. But here's an application. When your word becomes your flesh, you can dwell among the people you gave it to. When your word doesn't become your flesh, you have to hide from those very same people. Maybe people don't behold your glory because they don't believe your story, because your word has not become your flesh. Let's become people of our word. Let's become people of the word and then become people of our word. Maybe Billy Joel was right. Honesty, it's such a lonely word. (laughs) Everyone is so untrue. (laughs) Let's stop making excuses. It'll make your life better, I promise. It'll make your life better exponentially in a very short period of time. You know why? Because people will know they can count on you. When that happens, game over. Stay blessed by the best, my people. If it makes sense to you, you can subscribe. If it doesn't, please don't. Um, I love y'all. Look forward to seeing y'all next Wednesday. Bye for now.